I've come to Cape Town in South Africa to do something that I have always wanted to do, but well, I never thought I'd get the chance. I'm about to fly incredibly high to the very edge of the Earth's atmosphere. From here, I'm hoping to see something that only a handful of people have ever seen. The thin blue line, the fragile strip of gas that surrounds our whole planet. And this is what's going to take me there. So this is an English electric lightning. The most beautiful fighter aircraft ever built. This is when, when England built the best aircraft in the world. The Lightning is no longer in service, but this piece of magnificently overpowered engineering is going to take me 18 kilometres straight up. Actually, I read somewhere that the, when you read about the altitude of the Lightning, it says altitude estimated 60,000 feet, ceiling classified. So, don't know how high these can go. I've heard rumours they can go to 80,000 feet, <laughs> which is amazing. My journey will take me beyond almost all the molecules of gas that make up our atmosphere. If you feel you're going to get sick, yeah. use a bag, OK? Right. Hopefully not. experience what made the lightning famous, vertical takeoff. just seconds to reach nine kilometers up, but I'm still in the thickest layer of the atmosphere called the troposphere. But the further I climb, the thinner the atmosphere becomes. Up at 58,000 feet. 90% of the atmosphere is below me. The only people above me are on the space station. So beautiful. I'm now at 60,000 feet, 18 kilometers up, and the highest I can go. Above me, the sky is a deep, dark blue. so tenuous, just a tiny sliver of blue, amazing. The Mars rovers have really captured our imaginations, I suppose because they genuinely are explorers in the old-fashioned sense, you know, they're, they're the extension of our senses to the surface of another world. But they've also been very important scientifically because you can't really get to know another planet from orbit. You've got to get down onto the surface, you've got to touch it, you've got to dig down and examine it microscopically. And the rovers really have, by doing that, made some extremely important scientific discoveries.
One of the most significant of those discoveries was made in November 2004. The Opportunity rover was examining an impact feature called the Endurance Crater when it detected deposits of a remarkable mineral. This is the world's largest salt works on the Baja Peninsula in Mexico. And what they do here is just pump seawater into these lagoons and let it evaporate. And what they're after is this stuff, which is sodium chloride, table salt. But at different stages, different salts, the different minerals crystallize out. So all the things really that are in seawater emerge, crystallize out at different stages of the process. In one of the lagoons, pond number nine, the seawater is at exactly the right concentration to precipitate out these beautiful crystals that cover the entire floor of the lagoon. This is gypsum, and it's exactly the same stuff that opportunity found on the surface of Mars. Now, what's interesting about that discovery is how you make gypsum. You see, its chemical formula is CaSO4, so it's calcium sulfate, dihydrate 2H2O. That's water. So, the only way we know of, the only way to make gypsum here on Earth is to have calcium and sulfate ions in the presence of liquid water. So large deposits of gypsum on the surface of Mars tells you that there must have been big areas of water present for a very long time. The discovery of gypsum has helped build a picture of an ancient Mars that was much warmer and wetter. Subsequent discoveries of gypsum in networks of sand dunes suggest that large areas of Mars were once covered in standing water. And where there is standing water, there is the chance of life. This is the Matanuska Glacier in Alaska. It really is one of the most astonishing places I've ever seen. Now, this whole landscape is testament to the erosive power of this stuff, this mixture of ice and rock as it rolls down this valley over hundreds of thousands of years and creates this astonishing landscape. The reason it can do that is because of the delicate balance of the Earth's atmosphere. See, our planet is just at the right temperature and pressure to allow water to exist as solid, as liquid, and as gas, as vapour in the clouds. And so the sun can heat up the oceans and it can move the water over to the top of the mountains. It can fall as rain turn to ice become a glacier and then sweep down the valley to sculpt this astonishing landscape. Just as our atmosphere allows all this to exist, the atmosphere of Titan is the perfect temperature and pressure to allow something to exist that has never been seen before on a world beyond Earth. This is a picture taken of the South Pole of Titan by Cassini in June 2005. 
and it's subsequently become one of the most important and fascinating pictures in the history of space exploration. The interesting thing is this black blob here. Now this fascinated the Cassini scientists, but the, the explanation as to what that is had to wait just over a year till July 2006 when this picture was taken. And it's a radar image, this time of the North Pole of Titan. And you see, again, these huge black areas. But black, in this case, means that the radar waves that bounced onto them didn't come back, so they're completely black. And there's only one really good explanation for that. That is that they're incredibly flat surfaces. In fact, they're surfaces of liquid. So this picture combined with this picture means that this is the first observation of a liquid, a lake, on the surface of a body other than the Earth in the solar system. But these lakes, of course, cannot be lakes of liquid water because the surface temperature on Titan is minus 180 degrees Celsius. And at those temperatures, water is frozen as hard as steel. So, if these are not lakes of water, then what are they? Well, this is the Cava de Villa Luz in Tabasco, Mexico, the Cave of the House of Light. And it is the definition of a hostile environment to me because it's full of hydrogen sulfide gas, hence the gas monitor, which says at the moment one part per million hydrogen sulfide, very toxic for me, which is why I've got this gas mask in case it all gets too much. So it's a place where you, <laughs> at first sight, would not expect a great many life forms to survive and flourish. Although the cave is a death trap for us, that doesn't mean that nothing lives here. In fact, it's teeming with life. But look at these fish, just everywhere in the cave water, and they're adapted to live in these conditions. In fact, if you look at them closely, they're quite pink, and that's thought to be because they've got lots of haemoglobin because there's not as much oxygen down here and so they need to have an efficient way of moving oxygen around their bodies. Beautiful. But the really interesting life is found in the depths of the caves, where the concentration of poisonous gas is high enough to set off my alarm. Down here, Far from the light of the sun are organisms whose energy source comes from the air around them. They use the hydrogen sulfide gas bubbling up through these springs. The same gas that could be fatally poisonous to me is their source of life. Well, these things are what I came deep underground to see. These are snotites, and you can see why they're called that. They're really one of the most alien life forms that, that I can conceive of on the, on the Earth because they metabolize hydrogen sulfide. So they, they metabolize this faintly acidic and nasty gas that I'm just breathing in now. You can almost feel it on your tongue, actually, the acidity of it. They metabolize it, they react it with oxygen, and they produce sulfuric acid. So their breathing process, if you like, their version of what I do, I breathe in oxygen, react that with sugars and produce, you know, breathe out CO2 and get energy. These guys breathe in hydrogen sulfide and oxygen and produce sulfuric acid. In fact, I can test it here with this.
Yeah, you see, look at that. That, that, well, what looks like water, that secretion dripping off the snotites, has actually got a pH of, well, it's now about between 0.5 and 0. I mean, that's strong acid. That's as, that's as strong as battery acid. It's actually highly concentrated sulfuric acid. So what a, what a strange organism. It's alien in every sense of the word, except that it's present on the, well, just below the surface of our planet.